Cryptography. In this section, we'll look at some concepts and terms about cryptography. We'll talk about key generation and management, how one makes keys for cryptographic systems. We'll explore the history of cryptography, but we won't go into too much detail there. Uh, we'll look at symmetric and asymmetric encryption and the differences between them. We'll also talk about stream and block ciphers and the different ways of using encryption. We'll also talk about some non-encryption ciphers, and this is a little bit of a trivia question at that point. We'll also look at public key infrastructure and how uh, we can use these systems to ensure that we can pass keys back and forth safely. We'll talk about email security and finally some attacks on cryptographic systems. So first of all, let's just define cryptography very simple as the science of hiding information in plain sight. Uh, whether that's in text or in a picture or in audio, it's simply hiding that information in plain sight, making it difficult for some, the unintended party to actually read it or uh, obtain that information. So overall, in the basic way encryption and decryption works is we take something like a message, we can call it that, or in cryptographic terms, we'll call it plain text. And we take that plain text we run it through something called an encryption algorithm, simply a series of steps. Could be mathematical steps, could be in hardware, could be in software, but a series of steps to change that plain text. Usually those steps are based on some sort of key. It's an input into the encryption algorithm. We hope you keep that key secret. And what we get out of that encryption algorithm is something called ciphertext. And ciphertext is just what it looks like. It's designed to be difficult to read and understand. Uh, in this case, though, there's still an issue with this one is you'll notice that the letters and the spacing and the punctuation marks are still the same. Um, that would also give, make it easier to decrypt by an unintended party. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So then when the intended party gets the message, they have the secret key in this particular example. So this is a shared key example. We, both the sender and the receiver have to have the same key. And they use that decryption algorithm, with the, which is essentially reversing the steps that we started with in the encryption algorithm. And hopefully they get the plain text message that says, hey, hello, students. All right, so very simple, high level overview, I realize. We'll get into more detail. So there are three key ideas in cryptography. They're very simple ideas, but when we start applying them successively, it can make for some very difficult codes. So for example, the first idea is confusion. In other words, we want to perhaps substitute one letter for another. We'll look at that in a moment here. The other idea is diffusion, and that is that we move information, we change the order of the information, or we rearrange the characters of the information. And the last thing is that we should only have to worry about keeping secrecy in the key. In other words, let me go back to this picture for a moment here. That algorithm on the left and on the right there, the decryption and the encryption algorithms, those do not need to be secret in a good encryption system. If they are, that's fine. You know, NSA, I'm sure, keeps many of their algorithms hidden away. They don't want anyone to find them. But we shouldn't rely on keeping the algorithm secret for security. The only thing that we should rely on keeping secret is the key. All right, so this is sometimes called Kirchhoff's principle. And we'll see this in a little bit. So remember, our three key ideas are confusion, diffusion, and secrecy only in the key. So let's talk about some terminology. Again, we have to kind of lay the ground rules here. Cryptography, we said, was the practice and study of hiding that information, hiding that data. Cryptanalysis is the goal of finding some weakness or insecurity in a cryptographic scheme, with, of course, the goal of being able to break it so that you can find the information that's been encrypted that way. Encryption then would be transforming the data, in this case, plain text, into an unreadable format. Plain text, we said, was usually you know, some sort of text. Could be a video, could be a audio, could be a, you know, a movie, for that matter. They're encrypted, you know, items stored on a CD. If you buy a copyrighted CD, it's encrypted to make sure it only plays through a certain player. All right, so it's usually some sort of format that before we run it through the encryption. So ciphertext is the scrambled, so to speak, format that we get out of that. In other words, what we would get from encryption as we've said before. So decryption then would be turning that ciphertext back into plain text. And the encryption algorithm is the set of rules or the procedures that dictate how we go 
through encrypting and decrypting data. Sometimes it's also called a, called a cipher or an encryption cipher. You'll find in cryptography, there's many words that are used repeatedly and in different areas. So it helps to make sure we're on the same sheet of music when we're discussing cryptography. And the last thing we have is key. And if you want to be really geeky, you can call it a crypto variable instead. And that's just that value that we use to help the encryption or decryption process. So key space, yet another term here. It's the range of possible keys we could have. So for example, if I told you like your ATM card, you have a key that can be four digits or personal identification number as they call it. Well, four digits uh, would be the digits zero through nine. If you multiply that, you've got 10 digits, 10 possible digits in the first, second, third, and fourth places. That becomes 10,000 possible keys. So the key space is 10,000 numbers big or 10,000 keys big. And truthfully though, we lose some of those. For example, the bank takes away all the zeros and all the ones and they give you other rules. So eventually the key space gets smaller. All right. If it was six digits, we've expanded that key space up to a million. So just by adding two more digits. So key clustering is when two different keys can generate the same ciphertext from the same play text. We don't like this because we want our key to be secret. If I have a key that generates a certain ciphertext and you have a key that generates the same ciphertext, then that means you can decrypt my information. Not good. Now, work factor is a term that we use to describe how long it will take to break a crypto system. All crypto systems can eventually be broken. It's just a matter of time. So they're often measured in, in days, weeks, months, years, centuries, eons, you name it. Um, it. With, there's always the caveat of in today's current technology. If you are the one actually developing a crypto system, then you want to make sure you keep your algorithms open to review. You want to make sure that other parties can look at them and find weaknesses in the steps that you've chosen to take. Um, so we'll assume that the attacker knows the encryption or decryption algorithm. That's one way to ensure that we're working and concentrating on security. And it's the steps and the complexity of the algorithm, not the fact that it's secret. Remember, as we said, the only thing that needs to be secret in the crypto system is the key. Anything else, we can figure out some other way. Now, remember, we said the amount of processing power and time it takes to break a crypto crypto system, we're going to call that the work factor. And as we said before, no system's unbreakable. So our goal as we're developing a crypto system, if you ever get to work in this field, is to make it too expensive to break or make it too time consuming to break, at least by today's technology standards. Let's talk about key generation and management. So in general, the larger the key space, the more secure. We want key complexity. We want as many different keys as possible. So we also want to randomize the keys as we hand them out. And we need to make sure that we're using the full spectrum of the key space. We don't want to concentrate, you know, start at the beginning, your key number one, your key number two, your key number three. That becomes predictable then for the next person. Someone can easily figure out the pattern. So keys need to be completely random as they're distributed. So what we'll look at is some secure distribution, transportation, storage, access, lifetime. These are things that we have to concentrate on with keys. So make sure that you have a way to distribute that key to someone, just like password management. How do you transport them? How do you back them up? How do you store them? How does one access the keys? Now we're gonna talk about some systems a little bit later in this domain. Right? And then at the end of the lifetime, when someone no longer needs that key, is the key archived away? Is it destroyed? What do you do with that key when you no longer need it? So you should always back up at least the private keys. We'll talk about public keys in a little bit here and destroy them at the end of the lifetime, just as we said. All right, so it's a short history lesson here, and this is really just to place some ideas in your head about cryptography. So first of all, the Romans used to use this shift cipher. They called it a Caesar cipher. Remember we said that one of the things that we wanted to do was confuse people. And so confusion was a way of just shifting things around. Um, so shift ciphers, basically they shift, you know, you'd say move over three letters. So A becomes D. There you go, one, two, three. So for example, one of the classic shift ciphers is ROT13, which is short for rotate 13 characters. 
So you can see A becomes N, B becomes O, and vice versa, N becomes A. Uh, the interesting thing about ROT13 is that the same algorithm to encrypt is the exact same algorithm to decrypt, so it works in both directions. Um, and if you want to play with it, you can actually go to rot13.com to try, or you could figure it out for yourself, I'm sure. Um, but you see, so hello becomes U R Y Y B. Now, long ago, the Spartans came up with this thing called a Siddeli. Yes, it rhymes with Italy. Uh, it is a cipher, and so you'll notice that it wraps around here um, the message. And granted, you can't really read the message on it at the moment, but you'll notice the, the, the dowel there has different sides to it. And so you'd read across one side, and it's the number of facets on that dowel that would change. Now, if you pull this strip off, see, so it's one single vertical strip and put at just slight an angle. If you pull that strip off, those characters are now no longer in the order that they would read across the dowel. Now, so they're jumbled up. That's that transposition that we talked about. That's that diffusion of spreading the characters around, moving them around. I right, see, so we have our key ideas in here. And there's the other Sedeli. So send help becomes S-E-E-L-N-P-D exclamation H. Sure. A visionaire cipher was a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. So essentially any plain text character could have multiple corresponding cipher text characters. So rather than using just one alphabet to substitute to like we did with ROT13, we can use multiple alphabets. So it would look something kind of like this. Down the left hand side, you see a keyword letter. In other words, that's going to be our key. That's going to be our secret word. So let's say our secret word is marshmallow. Okay, there we go. So that starts with an M. And let's say that our message, our plain text, that's going across the top there, we're going to send the retreat, uh, retreat at 3 p.m. I don't know, something like that. But it starts with R. So we take the first letter of the key, in this case M, and line that up with the first letter of the message, R, and that becomes the letter D. So the R is going to be represented as a D in the ciphertext. And then the next letter would be, so the next letter of the keyword is A, as in marshmallow, and the letter of the text is E, right, for retreat. So it would stay the same. It would essentially be E up in the top corner of the fifth character over. So let's discuss symmetric encryption. Now, this diagram should look familiar to you already here. So symmetric encryption was actually what we were looking at the very beginning of this domain. Uh, I've highlighted, though, the secret keys there. They match in symmetric encryption. In other words, the receiver and the sender have to have the same key to both lock and unlock the, the ciphertext. Uh, so without that same key, no one can break this or, or open up. Well, they can break it, but no one can open up the message using the decryption algorithm. So it's also known as, and here's where things start to get confusing, because we're going to use terms multiple times. Symmetric encryption is also known as private key encryption. Now later when we talk about a form of asymmetric encryption called public key encryption, public key encryption also uses something called private keys. So make sure you know where you're discussing the term private key because it's dependent on the context. So in this case, private key means that we have a secret shared key. And I prefer to use the term shared when possible. Most, you got to securely distribute these keys to both parties. That's the hard part. Any interception, and when they, that defeats the whole purpose, the key becomes useless. So if the key is intercepted, it's done. Essentially, this is the way your passwords work. You know, you have a password, if someone knows your password, you and the you use the password to log into the server. You and the server have that shared secret. Should someone know your password, then it renders your password useless because now anybody can log in. So anyone with that key has to have the access to encrypt or decrypt. It's a very fast system. That's the advantage. And typically, this is what most encryption is, is using some sort of shared key. So later, we'll explore some ideas on how one gets the shared key from one party to another. 
So the other problem with shared keyed systems is that any two parties need a shared key between them to communicate. So the number of parties who want to securely communicate, as it increases, it means we the, the number of keys we need increases exponentially. So for example, just five people who want to communicate securely using a shared keyed system, they have 10 keys between them. You know, but if you get to up to a thousand people, there are 49, 400, sorry, 499,000 keys for these people. All right, now let's take a look at streaming ciphers versus block ciphers. So a streaming cipher encrypts one bit or perhaps a single character at a time. It's a, it's a small piece. It's just a single little unit at a time versus a block cipher that works on larger blocks of digits, usually some fixed size. And it's an unvarying transformation that happens each time to one block in succession after another. Um, but some block ciphers can effectively act as stream ciphers. We're going to see the difference here in just a moment. So let's talk about block encryption modes. The first one we'll look at is something called the electronic code book. Essentially, I take my plain text and my key and I feed it to my block cipher encryption algorithm and I get a chunk of cipher text. So each of those plain text items that you see there on the screen there are three separate blocks of the original plain text message. So it's block A, block B, block, block C and they get broken down into ciphertext blocks, and then the whole thing is put back together as one complete message to send. Um, if you look at this, you might be able to see a, a problem with this. There's just a small problem. If, let's say, the first and the third, so for example, if this plain text block and this plain text block of the entire message have the same contents, they're going to encode to the exact same ciphertext. Now the problem with that then is it makes it very easy for a cryptanalyst to look at that and see a pattern in your coded message, meaning they may be able to break it more easily. Decryption in electronic codebook works essentially the opposite way. We take a chunk, the first chunk of the ciphertext, we stick in the key, and the decryption algorithm gives us back our plain text. So it's a fairly straightforward process. So since there's a problem with patterns showing up in, in electronic codebook methods, what we've got is something called an initialization vector. Essentially, we add a random variable to throw the whole thing off. It's usually fixed size, and we throw it in there. It, now, we sometimes use this term pseudo random. It's very difficult actually in the computer world to create a truly random number, but we hope it's as random as possible. So that leads us to a different mode, something called cipher block chaining. And now you can see we've added something here. We've added that random initialization vector. So again, we take our first chunk of plain text, and this is a symbol for something called XOR. We'll talk about it a little bit more later, but essentially we combine it with this random value and then run that through the block cipher encryption algorithm and out comes our first chunk of ciphertext our first block right well that block of ciphertext then gets to be used as see what comes out of the encryption as the initialization vector for the next block hence the term chaining see so the second block is dependent on the first and so on down the line and what you've done is effectively, if you think about this, since this, if this is a random value to start with, even if this chunk right here of plain text and this chunk of plain text are the exact same chunk, the output will be different for each one because the random values will have changed. Now decrypting the ciphertext using cipher block chaining Again, it's relatively straightforward. We take our ciphertext and we have to have our shared key and out we get actually two things. We get our initialization vector in our plain text. So we take our key and we get put it into the next chunk of ciphertext and we get our plain text and we're really getting what was the initialization vector for the next one. You see, we keep taking this piece, the ciphertext becomes 
the next piece to get our plain text. We just simply XOR it again to get our plain text each time. Now, in, in XOR, we'll talk about an XOR function, but essentially it's a bit flip for those of you familiar with uh, binary arithmetic. We'll, we'll look at it and we'll explore it right now. For, the, for right now, the purpose is just to understand that essentially you're reversing that chaining process. We have another mode where we call an output feedback mode, or you'll see it abbreviated OFB. And again, we start with an initialization vector, but this time what we do is we just encrypt the initialization vector to begin with. See, so the initialization vector goes in, and then we combine the plain text with the ciphertext using that XOR function, and we go to the next one. That the output from this becomes the initialization vector for the next block. And as we keep going, so the thing about this is this can be very fast, and that's the advantage. XOR is a relatively simple function for a computer to do. So we're really only encrypting small sections at a time or are only going through, you know, this initialization vector is really the only thing that has to go the very first time. And it could be smaller than the actual plain text. And then the decryption, of course, works the other way. We take in our key and our initialization vector and drop it through, we end up with our plain text. Yeah, not so concerned if you understand the decryption as long as you recognize the different modes right now. No one has to become a cryptography expert for the CISSP exam. You simply need to be able to recognize that there are different modes and some of them have advantages over others when it comes to encryption. So we have yet another one here. This is cipher feedback mode. Now you'll notice that that line moved a little bit. We go after the XOR. In other words, we take the cipher, and that becomes the next item. Again, we're encrypting the initialization vector. Cipher feedback mode, again, slightly different, um, but similar concept of we're just doing, we're using one chain to, or one block to encrypt the next block in the chain. And decryption then works the opposite way. counter mode is yet another attempt at a way to reduce those patterns or the at least the appearance of patterns in ciphertext. And so in this case, rather than using an initialization vector, we start with, in essence, another random number, something called a nonce. It literally means a number used once. And we add a counter to that nonce. And we encrypt the nonce using the key and then XOR that right here with the plain text to get our cipher text. But notice they're not chained together. The counter just increments and then increments again. Now, this is very fast, um, but it does have its weaknesses in the sense of, you know, it's, it's, you know, once we've figured out this pattern, we may be able to see an incremental pattern develop in the code. And so possibly frequency analysis could still work against cracking this particular encryption. So decryption then works the opposite way. And we work our way down. We take now we're just XORing the ciphertext after the nonce has been encrypted. So let's take a look at stream ciphers, and that will explain the XOR concept a little bit more as well. So in Boolean mathematics, all right, if you have a bit and you have a second bit and you want to use the XOR function on them. Essentially, you're saying, if they're equal, give me a 0. If they're not equal, give me a 1. It works as a bit flip in a way. So for example, in this case, we have 0, 0. So our output if, after the XOR function would be 0. 0, 1, or 1, 0 both give me a 1, meaning input 1 and input 2 are different. That's it. it it's basically asking the question, are the two bits different, yes or no? If they're the same, the answer is zero. No, they're not different. So a stream cipher takes a key. So here's the encryption side of it. And we take that private key and go through a, something called a key stream generator, which is essentially just a stream of bits. And then the plain text is converted to bits. And we match up that those bits and a quick XOR function to get our cipher text stream. And then you know, the other end, we do just the opposite. We XOR again, and what we end up with is our key stream. So these are our plain text, sorry. So on each side of this, 
our sender and our receiver need to have the shared key in this particular example. And the key stream usually ends up being repeated because often the plain text is longer than the key. If the plain text is you know, a movie and the key is the word secret, written out in binary, then it goes secret, 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 secret is what the key stream generator does. Now, some key stream generators are better than others, but the two ends you need to match. So if you obviously need to figure out how to get this shared secret from one end to the other, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's an example of the data is going one, 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 you know, one, one, zero, one, all the way down the side here. Here's the data. Here's the key stream being generated based on some pattern, who knows. This is the cipher stream that would come out. You notice it doesn't really match up, it's over here. On the other end, we just need the key stream again, and when we do another XOR with cipher stream and key stream, we get the data again. See, so zero and one are different, zero and one are different, zero and zero are not different. Zero and one are different, see it gets us back to our original data stream. So key stream generation, it's hard work. It's actually best done in hardware than uh, in software, but you know, you will see it in software on occasion. It's very also very difficult is that what we want is to make sure that the key stream generator doesn't create repeating patterns. Um, that's again, hard to do because it all depends on the length of that key. Eventually it's going to repeat that key. We also want to make sure that it doesn't have predictable output. And, and what we mean is that it, it's not favoring essentially one set of zeros or ones, as you see at the bottom of the screen here. And it, we don't want it to be related directly to the key. So I've simplified in the examples here. Often there's more to it than just using like a word over and over again. It often gets transformed through certain encryption steps. Something in the algorithm transforms it and then that becomes the bit stream that works as the key stream. But regardless, we want to make sure that we don't see anything that looks directly like the key. In other words, I wouldn't just take the straight binary value of the word secret and use that as my key stream, as I illustrated in the previous example. So one solution to this idea, and this is a conceptual issue as well as a encryption issue, is something called a one-time pad. Uh, so this could be a bit length, this could be for actual characters of text. It's known as Vernum cipher. Essentially, if we make the key the exact same length as the plain text or longer, and we make sure that it's as random as possible, then if it's implemented properly, this is considered, it's one of the few things that's considered unbreakable in the realm of cryptography. Uh, of course, management of this is just nearly impossible. Uh, but uh, during wars, you've heard of, like you watch the war movies and you hear of one side trying to steal the other side's code book. And many times what they were doing is they literally had a pad of paper, hence the term one time pad and the characters or the alphabet to use for that particular code was listed on the pad and it was completely randomized. It was used just that for that one message. There's usually some sort of indicator block in the message to say, well, which sheet of that pad we're using. Once one of those sheets on the pad has been used, it must be destroyed. And so the hard other issue is making sure that you're in synchronization with the other, the receiving party. So the, hence why we add a little secret indicator block that says, okay, use page 37. So we make sure we're in sync. So it has to be used only once. It's gotta be shared by both sides. Distribution is again, the biggest issue that hence the, the good war movies, right? Where they were intercepting, someone was carrying a code book and the uh, other opposing side is going to intercept that and steal that code book. And it has to be as long or longer than the plain text message and composed of truly random values.